What is your most disturbing, scary, or creepy real story? Part 1. For more such content, please like and subscribe our channel Thread Tonic. Account 1. A few years ago, I was walking through the woods off the beaten track a bit, and I smelt this really overpowering sweet smell. Being nosy. I pulled back the undergrowth to have a look and found a dead body. The guy had clearly been there a while and wasn't looking great. All swollen and green and black with various runny bits. The local wildlife had also been dining well for a few days. I called the police who told me to wait with the body until they arrived, being in the middle of no, where it took a while for them to arrive and it got dark, and I was just sat there in the dark with him for a long time. It turned out he had committed suicide. For a long time afterwards, I had dreams about him, and he would talk to me and not nice things mainly about how he was angry I had disturbed his resting place and he wanted me to kill myself, probably just my imagination, but all pretty disturbing at the time. He still turns up in my dreams from time to time, and no doubt will be tonight after typing this. Account 2. I used to do suicide and murder cleanup. The thing that gets you about it is the smell. It's not that it's that bad, it's just that it's not as revolting as you would expect. That makes it worse that sickly sweet aroma of dead human. Account 3. About two years ago, I was driving home from a family reunion pretty late at night, and the drive was about two hours. I didn't stay the night because I had to be back for work the following day. Most of the drive was on roads with dense bushes and trees on either side. The real creepy ones you see a lot in movies. Anyway, I had been driving about 45 minutes and I was starting to get really tired. You know how sometimes you just suddenly become really tired out of nowhere? Well, yeah, that happened to me. I knew I wasn't going to last, but I didn't come across any place that I felt I could park and safely sleep. Anyway, after it became clear to me that I wasn't going to find a place to pull up, and my tiredness wasn't going away, I did something very questionable. I pulled over to the side of the road onto the grass behind some bushes to try and hide my car from anybody else who was going to come past. The roads weren't empty. I came across another car every few minutes or so. I made a mental note that the time was 11.22 and then fell asleep. Sometime later, I was awoken by a scratching sound. I looked at the clock, 11.50. The sound stopped after a few seconds, and because I was still extremely tired, I didn't bother looking around and simply went back to sleep, I was later awoken by the same sound, and it was now 1240. This time it really freaked me out because the sound didn't stop. The thought ran across my mind that it was just an animal inspecting the car, but why would it return almost an hour after it had left the previous time? I looked in my rearview mirror and just managed to catch a glimpse of something running away into the forest. Now, at the time, I thought it was the damn hook killer. You know the one that scratched that couple's car and then slaughtered the guy when he got out to investigate? Fuck that, I thought to myself. So I got the hell out of there. There was a bend no more than a hundred yards up the road, and as I came around it, there was a fucking car. Parked off to the side of the road with the driver's side door opened, I slowed down just to look to see if anyone was in there. There wasn't. Then I looked in my rearview mirror. I didn't see anything. And all of a sudden, this guy comes sprinting around the corner. He starts screaming at me, shouting stuff like, Hey! Hey, you! Get the fuck out of your car! Now I noted the fuck out of there and sped off. I never saw the guy again. Moral of the story, don't fucking sleep on the side of a deserted road. Account 4. A few summers ago, I went for a bike ride around midnight with a friend. We went our separate ways at the end of the evening, and I had about two blocks to ride back by myself. Because of construction, I had to ride on the sidewalk, but the streets were dead. But it wasn't a problem until right where I was about to turn left onto my street. There was this man walking by himself, maybe 40s, a little scruffy but not homeless. The sidewalk was narrow, and I didn't want to freak him out. So when I got about six feet behind him, I said, Hey, behind you! and he turned around and gave me this super angry look. I turned down me street, and he started to follow me.
literally screaming about how I was a fucking cunt and he was going to kill me and all that. I live right off the corner and I didn't want him to figure that out. So I decided to do another loop around the block. That's not the scary part. The scary part is that when I looped back around and looked down the street, I saw him standing on my fucking front stoop, staring out at the street like the motherfucker knew I lived there. He saw me ride by again, but he didn't say anything. I ended up going back to the friends, but my bike got stolen from the alleyway by the house two days later. Edit. The guy in question was definitely not actually homeless. We have a large population of mentally ill in that area, unfortunately. Downtown of a medium-sized city, so if I didn't think the sidewalk was too narrow to pass, otherwise I wouldn't have disturbed him. Half the scary part was that he looked pretty much completely normal for my area. That being said, I ended up texting my mom, and she made the decision not to notify law enforcement until my bike was stolen. Count five. This isn't very interesting. But I woke up with blood gushing down my cheek when I was younger, and I didn't feel anything. But my face felt wet. So I went down to my parents' room, and they freaked out. Till, this day we still have not clue what cut my face. But I needed eight stitches next to my eye. We checked the sheets, pillow, pillowcases, edges of the bed, etc. Still no idea. Account 6. My house sits farther back in the lot than most other houses. It is a strange layout as well. The sidewalk runs the length of the living room and ends at the front porch, which lets into the living room. Large windows that do not open allow great light to get into the living room, but at the cost of no privacy, the rest of my family was on vacation and having the house to myself, I decided I would get smashed. Well, I pass out on the couch in the living room at about nine, when I realized I was too scared to walk back to my room. The couch is right underneath these big windows. I woke up suddenly, not knowing why. I had a severe case of the chills, and I could not figure out why. Then the banging started. It came from right above me. I did not move, but I opened my eyes and looked up at the window. Someone was standing there, pounding on the glass. Without moving, I looked at the cable box. It was around three in the morning. The banging continues. Then it stopped suddenly, but I still did not move. Suddenly it commences again, coming from two different directions now. Someone is banging on the window and another person is banging on the front door. They kept doing it, would not go away. Finally, after about 40 minutes, they quit. It was the most terrifying event I can recall at the moment. It made me a nervous wreck after that. I called a friend the next day to see if he would come over and stay for the rest of the week, and his response was, what the fuck for? So that we can both be murdered in our sleep. Thanks a lot, asshole. Account 7. I was 17 and had just gotten my license. Back in high school, my friends and I had made it a mission to find abandoned houses to throw parties in. We had a few good candidates, but the mother load was this house I would pass on my home from work. It was an undeveloped shell of a huge home with a large property in the back. I had told one of my friends about it, and one day before we went to see a movie, I took him to the house. It was about dusk in summer, so I had my headlights on, I pulled into the front of the house and we were there for like 10 seconds tops before we pulled back to go to the main road. A minute later, this big truck pulls up behind us with its high beams on and riding our ass. My friend and I took note of it, but paid it no mind as we headed back to the main road. At the light, I turned right, but the truck cut through the gas station at the corner and blocked us off. Out of the truck comes this big hulk of a man, and my friend and I are shitting our pants. He raps on the window, and I roll it down. Now the really freaky part is that this a busy road, and now there was no one in sight. He asks us what we were doing at the house, and I quickly lied and said we were making a U-turn. He stares at us for a few seconds, smiles, and sends us on our way. To this day... The house remains unfinished, and I'm convinced it's a drug operation of some sort. TLDR, don't go into abandoned houses, man. Account 8. When I was about 10, all of my cousins and siblings were over. About 10 of us there. The parents and grandparents were out for an adult dinner. So it was just the kids sitting around watching a few movies, when all of a sudden the house shook, 
and there was a large flash coming from the backyard. It felt as if a bomb dropped. We all heard, felt, and saw it. And as a pack, we ran into the hallway. The eldest cousins in the group debated on calling the police, but opted to call the parents. After a few minutes, we gained our courage and ventured out into the living room again, this time with weapons, just in case. After a half hour with no other issues, the parents came home and thought we were insane. There was nothing wrong with the backyard, and no neighbors reported anything. It's been ten years, and we still talk about it, trying to figure out what it was. That has been the scariest thing to happen to me by far. Count nine. I once sat across from a guy who told me about killing his girlfriend, him cutting her into pieces and boiling her head. He explained why he killed her and wished he could talk to the parents so they could understand that what he did was a good thing. It wasn't. I sat with him for 45 minutes. As he went into detail, was the most surreal 45 minute of my life, source. Worked in Max Security Mental Health Facility. Account 10. Okay, so this happened to me last summer when I was back at my parents' house during the holidays. It was around 3 a.m., and I was in my room on my computer when I got a call from my sister. Now, that was already a little bit weird since my sister's room is just down the hallway from mine, and she could have just came in my room. I went to pick up, and the call ended as soon as I reached the phone. I figured that she wanted to speak with me, so I got up and went to her room. As soon as I reached her door, she started screaming that someone was in the room with her, so I busted in, and of course nobody was here. After she stopped crying, she told me that she woke up and saw a dark shadow just centimeters from her face, and that's when she screamed. So I told her that she called me. She tell me that her phone is not in her room and that she was sleeping. Sure enough, her phone is actually downstairs in her purse. The weird part is that I have the log of her call on my phone, but she doesn't. Never managed to explain this one. Account 11. I was delivering a hot tub to this contractor, realtor, in this fancy gated community near Branson, M.O. When I arrived, the construction workers were in charge of telling me where the thing was supposed to go. It was going on the fourth floor balcony, but because of the way the house was built, the fourth floor was ground floor. The other three floors were on the side of a hill, but the driveway was even with the first fourth floor entrance, if that makes sense. So, a lot of construction going on, but to get the hot tub on the balcony, I had to make a ramp, take it from the drive, down into the yard, up a ramp to the porch, through the living room door, across the living room, out the back patio doors onto the deck. Problem with this was, the deck was unfinished. A huge section of decking was missing. They had literally installed only enough decking so that I could go from the patio doors to the far corner of the deck where the hot tub would sit. There was no railing. The hot tub weighed 900 pounds, and it was a four-story drop if I fell. The construction workers volunteered to help me. We got it out onto the deck, crossed the narrow bridge of installed decking to the corner, and I was about to lay it down. You move these on a dolly while the hot tub is on its edge for clarification— Laying it down isn't that hard. You tilt it, bring it down to your lap, grab the strap securing it to the dolly and lower it to the deck. It's very controlled, and I'd done it thousands of times. However, this deck wasn't finished, so the contractor wanted to leave it on its edge. It's a lot harder to take it off when it's standing up, because the dolly is under a 900-pound tub, but... I've done it before. I told them that we would have to put blocks under one side of the dolly, tilt the tub, and pop the straps to release the dolly so it could be removed from the area. Then you tilt the hot tub back, remove the blocks, and then set the hot tub down on the deck. Problem. The deck wasn't wide enough to allow me to do this safely. I popped the strap on the hot tub, put the blocks under, and I tilted the hot tub. But that put me with my feet four inches from the edge of the deck, with nothing but four stories of air behind me. We were able to free the dolly on one side, but not the other. The hot tub had to be leaned over further toward me. I tell everyone to freeze, and they do. I didn't want anyone messing with it because I had to shift my feet back five inches so my heels were off the deck. I'm freaking out, but it's all going smooth. I have a construction worker on each side of me helping support the tub, three construction workers freeing the dolly, and one useless worker playing with the strap that is going to secure the tub to the house so that the wind doesn't blow the tub over. 
We are inches from having the dolly freed when one of the construction workers freeing the dolly gets impatient and kicks the corner of the tub to dislodge it from the dolly. It works for him, but unfortunately for me, I didn't have my feet set yet. I shout that I'm falling. The two guys beside me take the weight of the tub, but no one can get to me. My arms are windmilling. I'm bent almost double backwards, trying my darndest to stay on the deck. I can see the boulders down below out of the corner of my eye. I'm falling, and there isn't anything I can do about it. I feel myself go. I'm falling. My heels slip out from under me, and no one can reach me. But then suddenly, I'm flying forward. Something is under the small of my back, and it's slamming me into the bottom of the tub. The dolly is removed, and the tub stood up with me hugging it before I find out what saved me. The useless guy playing with the strap had already secured one end to the house. When I fell, the strap was already behind me, hanging off the deck. The construction worker pulled it tight with all his might arresting my fall. It wasn't there for that purpose, but he saved my life that day. I would have been dead if not for him. I thanked him by sending him and his wife and kid to Breckenridge, Colorado for Christmas. It was actually a vacation I'd saved for and was about to surprise my wife and daughter with, but I felt he deserved it more. Plus, my wife and daughter didn't know anything about it. Yeah, that was one of my most scariest moments ever. TLDR, fell off a fourth floor deck, but construction worker saved me at the last moment, so I rewarded him with a vacation to Breckenridge, Colorado. Account 12. This is not supernatural creepy, but is one of the more disturbing and surreal experiences of my life. One early morning, a few short years ago, I'm walking to my bus stop and eating a banana. It is dark, misty, around 5 a.m., and I am internally debating something trivial, like if I want my daily Starbucks before or after the commute. As I approach the dimly lit corner on my street, a tall man in a black mask steps out of the dark alleyway to my left. Sleepy and disoriented, I barely acknowledge him. When he shouts, put down your fucking purse and points his gun to my head, things start to click, the man says. Put down your bags, and I tell him, okay, okay, I'm putting them down over here. He orders me to walk over to him, toward the alley, and get down on the fucking ground. And I agree. I'm coming, okay, okay. My heart is beating a million miles a minute and my hands still smell sticky with banana. I know I need to get away. I don't know why, but my mouth won't stop working. Look, see, I'm on the ground. My stuff is over there. Please just take my stuff, but he doesn't like it. Shut the fuck up, okay? He gets on top of me and puts the gun to my head. At this point, I should mention the fact that I'm on my way to coach a high school practice and I'm dressed like a dude. Huge baggy pants, hat, yacket. If not for my tell, tail voice, I'd look like a prepubescent 90s rap star anyway. As the guy gets on top of me, gun to my head, he looks at me and pauses. I can't tell you why I know this, but I swear that at this moment, it clicks for him that I'm a woman. He gets off of me, stands up, and points to the dark alley. Come with me. My stomach hurts. I remember that there have been a recent rash of sexual assaults in my neighborhood. During the daytime, no less, when the man points down that dirty alleyway, my internal voice speaks the fuck up, says voice one. There was no way in hell you were going to go down there without a fight. But he has a gun, you dipshit, replies voice. Two, fucking follow me, the real voice. His voice hollers. So I do what I do best. I talk. I'm coming. I'm following you. I call. And the man makes a crucial mistake. He believes me. I take one, two tiny steps backwards toward the sidewalk. And he turns his body and his gun toward the alley. This is my moment. I take a deep breath, tuck my head down in case he starts shooting, and start sprinting away. I hear a voice screaming in a high-pitched wail before I realize that it's mine. After running six or seven blocks, I head back to my apartment, hoping he's not there to see where I lived. The police check out the alleyway an hour later, but the potential attacker is long gone. The only evidence of the encounter is my banana peel browning in the alleyway and the adrenaline rush that I couldn't shake for days. I would be lying if I said that. If that experience doesn't bother me still, but I'm so fortunate to mainly be haunted by the what-ifs and not the 
What dids? Account 13. My grandmother swore by this story till her dying day. It was during the war in London, and my dad was a baby. She was bombed out of her house and was staying with a friend. The friend had set her up in a room on the top floor. Anyway, she was taking my dad upstairs to bed when a figure materialized on the stairs telling her not to sleep in that room tonight. She noped back downstairs and told her friend that she and my dad were sleeping in the sitting room that night. Her friend was annoyed but agreed. That night, a bomb exploded near the house and the roof caved in right on top of my dad's cot. He would have been killed.